Good afternoon. My name is Pavia Lal. I'm excited to be here to talk to you about the possibilities and challenges of on-orbit services. Just a couple words about me. I'm a researcher at the IDA Science and Technology Policy Institute, which is an, a federally, research, federally funded research and development center, an FFRDC, created by Congress to provide objective, unbiased, and data-driven advice to the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. For the last five years or so, we have worked with NASA, the National Space Council, OSTP, and other federal agencies to examine and evaluate on-orbit servicing, assembly, and manufacturing, what I lovingly called OSAM. Uh, my remarks today will focus on one of these three areas, on-orbit servicing. So let's get started. Um, what is on-orbit servicing? It's really important to start with definitions. On-orbit servicing is the on-orbit alteration of a client spacecraft or satellite after its initial launch using another servicing spacecraft or system to conduct these alterations. It's a collective term that includes a number of actions such as orbit modification, replenishment of onboard resources such as propellant, hardware maintenance, the common thread being that they are all carried out in orbit. Uh, we have organized a range of activities into, an, into a taxonomy we call the six R's that actually builds on previous NASA efforts to define satellite servicing. Before we get into the six R's, it is important to know that that servicing is different from two other activities in space that are also pretty important, assembly and manufacturing. Assembly involves the on-orbit aggregation of components to constitute a space-based system, subsystem or full spacecraft, and manufacturing involves the on-orbit transformation of raw materials into usable spacecraft components or a full spacecraft even. And as I said, this discussion will focus on servicing. So, Let's get started with the very first area, which is remote survey. Next slide. Um, so when a satellite is not performing as planned, it can be useful to examine it for signs of damage or malfunction. You can try to evaluate the quality of images from ground-based telescopes, of course, or radar even, but that is insufficient for most desired diagnosis. Also, a satellite may not be oriented properly for ground-based telescopes to see the affected exterior components. Instead, what you can do is take images from a nearby satellite equipped with appropriate cameras. This is essentially R1 or remote survey. Um, remote survey is important because it allows operators to better understand failure modes. So for example, to see why a solar panel didn't unfold and plan future operations accordingly. So what's a possibility here, since a lot of what I'm talking about is about the possibility of uh, on-orbit servicing, right? I'll, I'll start with an example. In 2018, Viasat 2 was launched. The satellite was designed for a throughput of 350 billion bits or gigabits, 350 gigabits per second, but the spacecraft was achieving only about 260. An antenna deployment issue was suspected, but no in-space imagery was available. An insurance claim of, uh, I think, $200 million was paid. Had the insurance company had access to diagnostic imagery, it might have allowed them to adjust the payout. Indeed, between 2004 and 2014, there were at least five deployment failures that we know of amongst commercial geosatellites. To what extent would having remote survey services have helped? Now, that's a possibility to think about. Moving on to the next, uh, we have relocation. You know, uh, uh, most satellites maintain their orbits precisely by having propulsion systems. As the satellites are launched with an amount of fuel calculated to enable them to maintain orbit throughout their design lifetime. But sometimes things go wrong. Relocation services would allow satellites that are out of fuel or disabled in any way to be moved um, um, but relocation can actually take many forms, the moving piece. There's orbit maintenance, as I mentioned. Uh, orbit maintenance can extend a satellite's lifetime by holding its position in orbit. There's orbit transfer. You could save satellite a lot of fuel or provide a more efficient means to change orbits. And you can deorbit satellites, remove space debris or allow a satellite 
to comply with deorbit regulations. Uh, here also an example would be very useful. Uh, as you all may know, there are numerous rocket bodies left in orbit by the former Soviet Union. Each weighs many tons. And, in, in, and they're in, or, in orbits that intersect orbits of other important satellites. The collision of any two of these objects could generate tens of thousands of new debris objects. Now assume a collision between a rocket body and a satellite, and you know, for take for example, the Iridium constellation, which we know has annual revenues of about $400 million or 6 billion total over the uh, constellation's expected lifetime. Now assume there might be a, a collision between a, a, a Soviet rocket body and an Iridium satellite. That would be quite disastrous. Um, um, even if, uh, even if the, uh, the propulsive satellite uh, or a vehicle with sufficient thrust and control to deorbit a large rocket body might cost you know, many millions of dollars and launching it would be another tens of millions of dollars. However, the benefit of executing this mission is in the billions of dollars. Not to mention that other LEO satellites would also benefit from avoiding a large debris event. Moving on to the next category, which is refueling, um, it's pretty obvious. I mean, um, as you all know, for commercial geosatellites, it's been estimated that over half of satellites are sent to the disposal orbit solely because the propellant is exhausted, even when all other systems are function functioning nominally. Extending the life of such a latent life but still functional satellite can result in additional revenues for its operator and, and can provide benefit in terms of fleet flexibility and capital expenditures. And again, this is not just about commercial uh, satellites, right? I mean, government satellites or you know, civil satellites may similarly benefit from their fueling. Um, the next category is repair, you know, pretty obvious. Um, uh, as you uh, know well, large satellites cost hundreds of millions of dollars, and, and if they're national security satellites, even billions of dollars to manufacture and launch. Occasionally, a solar panel or an antenna will not deploy properly. This can greatly degrade the performance of the satellite. The value of correcting a deployment um, can be hundreds of millions of dollars as well. A, a, a deployment anomaly can be hundreds of millions of dollars. Enter repair. Um, you can restore a satellite to its design specifications to operate nominally and allow uh, entities to save a failed satellite and still get a return on investment. And again, that applies to you know, commercial and uh, government satellites. Next step, uh, R5 is replace parts. Uh, um, in a similar idea, and many satellites, particularly the large geocommunication satellites, have mission lifetimes of over a decade. During that time, they may suffer from obsolescence. And it could be either because it's technology improvement that they would want to uh, uh, um, integrate or change, change your changes in subscriber needs, right? If their subsystems are still functioning nominally, they may still provide a valuable service as by acting as hosts for new capabilities delivered and installed in orbit. R5, or you know, repairing of parts, can allow satellites to be upgraded over time, such as by adding larger antennas and solar panels. Now, here's a possibility. Uh, and again, an example from uh, recent history. In, in uh, last year, October 2019, UTELSAT announced that one of its satellites experienced a potentially fatal anomaly with one of the satellite's two solar panels failing to deploy. This could reduce the satellite's revenues by five to 10 million euros per year and, and, and in addition require um, operational costs to deal with antenna pointing issues over the course of its lifetime. The satellite was designed to operate for 15 years, meaning that the company could lose over 150 million euros over the course of its lifetime. In principle, a serving satellite, whether to repair the panel, replace it, or even provide power through other means would likely cost far less than this 15 year net present value of the lost revenue. So again, something really important to think about. Uh, last but not least, and this is one uh, area that uh, NASA and other uh, folks haven't typically talked about, but we uh, learned as part of our research. It's, we call it recharge. Um, so one way to 
to supply power to a satellite involves placing solar reflectors near the client satellite that divert sunlight directly to the client's solar panel. This method doesn't require the satellite to be designed with any special hardware and works with virtually all, all existing satellites. Another, another method might involve power beaming using microwaves, either from a nearby servicing satellite or from a, even a ground station. In our research, we have not seen many examples of the service, but we have seen some. So, so I want to include it for the sake of completion. So these are the six categories of on-orbit servicing. Um, one takeaway from this discussion that I would like you all to have is that while they all fall under the umbrella of on-orbit services, each activity has its own unique set of applications, market drivers, policy drivers, and even technology development pathways. So, so, so that's just something to keep in mind as, as you go uh, forward through the rest of your day. Um, and of course, this also means that each has its own set of challenges. Uh, we may not have enough time to talk about challenges by topic area or by, by, uh, by one of the R areas, but uh, let's give a shot to kind of looking at challenges across the board. Um, going on to the next slide, um, this is sort of the list of the challenges as, as we see them. Um, Dave, can you get to the orange set of slides? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, just moving on to the next slide. Uh, the first challenge, and I mean, it's the most basic one, relates to technology development. Uh, um, uh, it, this is the area where I, as I mentioned, each of the R areas are super different. Um, and we may, we may be much farther along with one area such as remote survey or relocation than we may be about others refueling or repairing parts. Um, uh, um, but across, if you, if you want to look across all of the areas, I think computer vision is particularly important for non-cooperative servicing and rendezvous and proximity operations, as is guidance and navigation control. These, these two areas tend to be common to all, all, all development and where we need to make a lot more progress. Uh, depending on which on-orbit service we, we are talking about, the other areas become important, electric propulsion, deployable systems, and optical communication begin to kind of take a more, a more important place with respect to developments that are needed. Uh, moving on to the next challenge, uh, uh, again, no surprise, uh, it's, it relates to launch. Launch is an interesting challenge because it works both ways. Lower launch prices could make it more affordable to flight test new systems. However, and this is kind of interesting, a lower launch price may also hurt the demand for some areas of servicing, since it may be cheaper to simply launch a new satellite uh, than to repair or replace it. So the trade-offs are very specific to individual services and even timelines. Moving on to a third challenge, it's that of standards. Um, open standards would help prevent proprietary systems that are not sufficiently mature from gaining too much market share or pushing out other better ideas. Um, currently, we are still working as a community to develop common standards. And I'm sure you'll hear more about uh, this particular topic as the day goes on, uh, uh, as the day goes on. Uh, and I hope that Brian Whedon will talk about confers and other efforts to develop standards. Um, uh, uh, an, another challenge is actually there's a host of challenges related to the role of government. The government has an important role both with respect to throwing up barriers for on-orbit servicing, but also lowering them. So first tip is regulations, which again, uh, I, like launch, are a double-edged sword. Sometimes the presence of regulations is detrimental, and sometimes the lack of regulations is. Uh, restrictions related to technology sharing, uh, for example, to prevent tech transfer, especially government to private transfer, are problematic. Similarly, restrictions on the export of specific technologies could hamper the development of on-orbit services. And the devil is obviously in the detail here, and we can talk more about it. And at other times, it's a lack of regulations that's a challenge, right? So for example, that we don't have strong property rights in space disrupts the market case for salvage of objects in space. And salvage of objects in space is is exactly what you think it is, uh, basically taking 
things that may be floating around in space and reusing them for other, uh, for other, uh, other applications. Um, creating some regulations may actually help develop a market for on-orbit servicing. So for example, regulations that require the rapid removal of satellites that are no longer operational would reduce debris in space and the process for satellite operators into acquiring deorbit servicing, thus establishing a market case for relocation. Similarly, mandates on maneuvering, again, to reduce collisions in space, could necessitate satellite operators expending more fuel, which would potentially provide the market case for refueling services. So regulations can really play a major role in creating the market for some areas. Moving on to the next, uh, next slide. Um, um, regulations aren't the only way the government can jumpstart or stifle servicing. Um, our current space architecture is an example here. Uh, this is where we launch large satellites on large and powerful rockets. And, you know, it kind of really monopolizes and, and makes it difficult for us to have a diverse uh, a space ecosystem. Um, in, instead of building large rockets, uh, large and powerful rockets, the government could encourage the building of smaller rockets that refuel in space such a disaggregated architecture that could support on-orbit services such as fuel depots or even parts storage facilities would in turn lower the barrier to entry of new companies and reduce the cost of operating and doing things in space. In other words, the way the government does business is, is, is potentially a challenge to um, uh, making it easier for on-orbit services to come into play. Um, uh, the last two challenges kind of deal with uh, the, the, the rationale for, um, for having these services. Uh, uh, the challenge is lack of customers in the private sector. And this, of course, in turn leads to lack of investor confidence. At the moment, there isn't a strong market for most on-orbit services. I and mean, we see onesies and twosies, right? We saw an application of R2 orbit transfer where Northrop Grumman's uh, mission extension vehicle, MEV, uh, it docked to an Intelsat satellite to provide life extension. Other than these one-off examples, on the whole, there isn't a thriving market for on-orbit services. Um, partly because there is a mismatch between the cost of providing these services and the cost customers are willing to, to pay. Uh, and recently, there was a speech by, uh, I think, the CEO of Leo operator Iridium. I'll just stick with Iridium as my examples. Um, it makes this point. Iridium floated a price of $10,000 they would be willing to pay to deorbit a satellite. This price appears to be far lower than what companies are considering offering. It is certainly orders of magnitude lower than the $130 million that ESA is likely going to be paying to remove a rocket body. Uh, so so, so this, this mismatch has to be somehow addressed. Either satellite companies have to be willing to pay more for deorbiting or, or, or the government uh, in, in that uh, scenario, or the price of the services have to, has to come down quite a bit. Um, there is optimism, however, that demand for services may grow. For example, if LEO-based broadband services are successful, on-orbit services may be called upon to remove non-functioning satellites or to tow satellites from incorrect to correct orbits. Um, same for geo. If a geo-based satellite becomes a bigger part of a broadband provision uh, system, other services such as re repairing satellites or replacing parts or assembling uh, may, see, may see more considerations. And, and here actually there is, you know, we have a big if on this communication piece and I do want to throw it out. If terrestrial services vastly outperform space services through, let's say, advantageous life cycle properties, you know, rapid deployment and iteration, even with the growth in overall demand, on-orbit services could see low, lower likelihood of commercial success. And again, here I'm talking about specifically about uh, 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 broadband, space-based broadband. Uh, Last point I want to make, uh, uh, demand closely tracks investor confidence and availability of venture capital. Uh, and this is where there's some interesting cultural issues like failure in one area 
uh, of the on-orbit service makes it difficult to raise capital in another, even if the two are unrelated technologically or, or, or have other sort of differences. Um, the reverse is true as well. You know, the success of MEV likely will cause lots of different interesting and important um, uh, investments in, in the area of on-orbit servicing. So that's what I got. I hope you all have an excellent day of learning and discussion. And I look forward to answering any questions you have.